And good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another thrilling episode of the Tree Stuff Educational Webinar Series. We've got the dynamic duo here tonight. And for those of you that are not going to be going to Avengers Endgame and decided to stay with us and spend some time talking about the Spotted Lantern Fly, we appreciate you being here. So we have Trent Dix from Arbor Jet, and we have Brian Walsh. He is from Pennsylvania. He lives in Ground Zero. And tonight, you know, all kidding aside, we're talking about something very serious. It's the Spotted Lantern Fly. We're going to talk about how to combat it, what to do, and uh, best practices basically out in the field. Brian is an expert. He's been talking about the spotted lanternfly. He's given over a dozen lectures on this for the last couple of years. And of course, you guys hooked up with each other to kind of do your own um, research. So tell me a little bit about how that happened. Mainly, I am uh, Brian's technical manager for ArborJet, and he called me out for Emerald Ashbore. And there it was, spotted lanternfly, and he, he took me on a tour. Go ahead, Brian, share the rest. So we went for a look at it in about 2016, and we had a hard time finding them. They were here and there, spotty. And the following year, I called Trent and said, you got to come see this, because it was all of a sudden everywhere in big numbers. Still in a localized area, but the numbers are impressive. And when you see some of the images later today, it's... it's uh, it's one of those things that's really hard to believe until you actually live it. Yeah, yeah, yeah I bet. Yeah. Well, we appreciate you guys being here. And again, we appreciate you tuning in. And if you have questions, get on Facebook and start plugging away because we'll be answering them throughout the entire webinar. And of course, uh, you know, this goes along with what to see out in the field and uh, along with uh, proper injections and what to use. Right, guys? Absolutely. Yep. All right. Well, I'll let them take it away. Thanks for joining us. And here you go. All right. Yep, so I'm Brian, and uh, my company is Salic Springs Land Landscaping. I've been dealing with this for a couple years now. It landed not far from our house. Originally, the spotted lanternfly uh, came in from China, and it arrived probably as eggs. But like we've dealt with the other, other uh, invasive insects, people say, well, what's the big deal? Is it killing all the trees? And the short answer is not really but it's important and you'll see why. There's some things about this that is really different. Um, the first thing is the mobility of this insect. All through all life stages, it's pretty mobile. It's moving, it's constant. When you look at a property, it might be on one tree one day, it might not be on that property, it might be on the neighbors the next day. And the other thing is your customers are gonna become readily aware of it when they have it. Uh, things like emerald ash borer, Customers see that the tree is dying, but they don't really see the borers themselves. And this one, you can't miss it. The customers freak out, and you're going to have to learn how to deal with this in a uh, common sense, a little bit smart manner, uh, or it's not going to be able to do well for you. So you imagine a customer comes home, and they encounter this scene, and what's the first thing they do? They're going to try and get those bugs exterminated. And that's not the easiest thing to do. You can spray, you can spray what's there at that time, and then the next day there might be that many or more back again. And so it really limits your options of what you can do. So it was originally discovered in Berks County near the Pike District Township border in September of 2014. Uh, it's a really rural rare area. And um, the spotted lanternfly, like Cormodal catula, it's a plant hopper. It's not a tree hopper, it's a plant hopper. It's native to China, Indonesia, Vietnam. There, it's not as big a deal because there's native predators that keep it in check. And it was probably introduced as eggs on packing material um, or a product. And when the eggs hatched out, then it had free reign with no predators to keep it in check. Uh, population continued to grow for a number of years probably until it was noticed and what this bug does is it feeds on the phloem of the tree just underneath the bark that sugar rich area and as you can see in that picture one on a tree is easy to miss and so it can go unnoticed in a new location for quite some time until the numbers build up uh, originally, it was quarantined out into just a couple of townships in two counties in 2015. Uh, 2018, you see that southeastern corner of Pennsylvania. We're now up to 13 counties. 
and those 13 counties are under quarantine and there's specific rules that the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture has put in, uh, in place to try and prevent the spread of it. And we're going to talk a, a little bit about how it spreads. There's a couple ways that it spreads. It spreads naturally. It can fly, it can walk, and it can hitch rides. It's really good at hitching rides and there's two ways that it does it. One is as adults mainly as adults, they hang on really well. And you can see in that picture, blown up 65 times, they have a suction pad there and roll a pad like a fly that allows them to walk on uh, glass and windows and ceilings and everything. And they also have those tarsal hooks on the end. And you can actually feel them. If they land on your neck, they'll pinch a little bit. It's not too bad. But that combination allows them to hang on to things like the hood of a car. And this is not a scientific analysis, but that 35 miles an hour is pretty consistent. When I've had them on the hood of my truck, they will hang on there till 35 miles an hour until they blow off. That's on the hood. So you can imagine if these things are crawling up underneath your car, underneath your truck, and they're getting up into the undercarriage on top of the transmission where they're sheltered from the wind, they got a free ride and they're not gonna fall out. So the other, the other issue then too is how the eggs, um, how the eggs are laid onto different objects and moved like the way we think it got here. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But one of the things I want to really get into here off the bat, everything I'm telling you is what we know now to be true. A lot of this has changed, it's grown, we're learning. This is a relatively short time with a new bug in a new environment. So in 2015, when there was first public meetings, the takeaways from that were that Researchers didn't think that they could fly well. They kind of hopped and glided more like a grasshopper. The eggs they thought were laid within six feet of the ground. And they thought that the Atlantis altissima, the tree of heaven, was the key to this. That they had to take a meal in order to develop from nymph to adult. And so they, reached, they immediately started um, treating Atlantis altissima. Removal, creating trap trees, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And they said that the nymphs walk up and down the trees daily. And so they were employing these sticky bands, which are essentially just sticky paper wrapped around the tree that would physically catch the insects. And they caught a lot that way, thousands and thousands that way. So what we were supposed to do was scrape eggs where we found them. And we weren't allowed to move materials without inspecting the, uh, the materials for eggs. And you could use sticky bands on your hands to try and swat the adults to try and catch them and report it to the PDA. And for the most part, the community was very receptive, willing to work with the PDA, and uh, did a lot. People went out and spent weekends looking for and destroying egg masses. And we jump forward to 2016, and, and it was spreading a little bit more. The numbers were getting more noticeable. And at this point, it showed up near my backyard. And from where that started and where it was found in 2014, that's seven, seven point some miles. That's pretty far for something to spread by hopping and gliding. And the takeaways at this point was keep them from reproducing. I love that statement. Uh, it's pretty much how you stop things from spreading. But the um, quarantine, try and contain them, okay? And the key to controlling this was establishment of trap trees with the Atlantis. And that involves removing 90% of the Atlantis, which is an invasive plant in and of itself, and then leaving the 10% remaining, hopefully, male trees that can't reproduce, treating them with a systemic insecticide so that when these insects come take a bite, they'll, they'll get a lethal dose and die. But they also realized at that point, they documented that 20 other, 24 other trees found in the Pennsylvania forest were also hosting this bug. And then the statement became that they were pretty sure that it needed the Atlantis in its diet in order to reproduce. So they also kept thinking that the breakouts and spread of this was caused by human movement. And, and that's true, where there was big jumps out of the area. But they were still pretty sure that it couldn't fly well. Jump up to 2017. Fall 2017, we're now 14 miles straight line from where this thing was originally found. And if you look at where that ends up in the bottom there, there's an aerial shot of a development, and that's where Arborjet came in and did some experiments uh, last year. And 
started to do some real research on how to actually deal with this in a common sense manner. So 2017, the USDA got involved. They came in. Uh, the federal government put $17.5 million into combating this insect. And here we are. The acknowledgement that they can fly had to take place because we saw swarms and swarms of these on warm, dry days in the fall. It was almost like a biblical plague where the sky fills with them. Uh, a graduate student at East Stroudsburg raised them from egg to adult on plants other than Atlantis. There was no reproduction at that point, but that's really actually hard to do, and I'll tell you why in a minute to get them to reproduce uh, in, a, in a quarantine setting. So one of our customers is a retired research scientist, and she lives near the original core. We treated a 46-inch diameter silver maple tree, and she used representative grid sampling and swept her patio every 24 hours and counted how many were on so many blocks and realized that in a three-month period from treatment, we killed about 48,000 adults off a single silver maple tree, and there's also abundant Atlantis right in the near vicinity. That confusion with the Atlantis is still continuing. There's a statement put out by the State Department of Agriculture rep saying that the Atlantis needs it in its diet in order to reproduce its life cycle. I'm going to talk to that in a second. How do we know that they need Atlantis? We really don't. And so what we're doing now, we're, do, we're working with some Penn State entomology researchers and we've planted trees in quarantined um, enclosures that will keep nymphs in there from nymph to adult on trees that, with the exclusion of Atlantis. And we're going to see if they reproduce. And part of the problem of this is these things are such voracious feeders constant feeding that in the quarantine greenhouses they actually have to rotate out the trees pretty rapidly because they get depleted down from the flow and feeding of the adults. And we're, we're thinking that some of the reason that they're not getting reproduction in the quarantine in any great numbers is because they can't keep the sap flow up on these plants. That's how much is being depleted as these adults are feeding. So where are we now? Unfortunately I have the distinction to say that uh, Mike Bosold from Bosold Nursery today documented the first hatch, so happy hatch day for 2019. It's a little bit early. His site is on a building where it's artificially warmed up on the masonry. Last year, it was somewhere around May 17th, we saw the first hatches of the eggs, and that's probably, will be another week or two in the wild and on plant material, but today is officially happy hatch day for 2019. So back to what your customers encounter. This is not an uncommon sight. When you come home and you see this all over your tree, this can arrive from the time you left in the morning to come to home to this scene. And it's freak out time. Um, the numbers are impressive. The, the, the life cycle of this bug, it lays eggs, generally starting in uh, late September. Some go a little bit earlier. And they lay these eggs. We've tried dormant oils. There's some success, but it's not real consistent. And these guys are real good at laying under sheltered items inside the crags of trees, in knot holes, under the peeling bark of exfoliating bark trees. Uh, they're really good at putting eggs in any kind of sheltered spot. Definitely the undersides of limbs is where you're going to look. And so what you see there is a female laying eggs, and they lay them in perfectly straight rows. There's 30 to 50 eggs in each egg mass. And then she'll come back and put that waxy covering on, that white waxy covering. And if you see just underneath her where it's darkened out to a brownish color, that's a little bit older egg mass. That's an egg mass that was laid probably about a day earlier. So it'll go from that bright white to blending in really well with the bark. In this picture, you can see the top lanternfly. She's just starting to lay down a row of eggs. The second one just beneath her, the, big, the biggest one, She's covering up with wax, and you can see those perfect rows, and then just ahead of her is an already covered mass. So they just lay, when they find a spot, they all tend to pile up, not always, but they will pile up, and sometimes they'll lay eggs on top of eggs. And those eggs can be laid on everything from plant material to rusty metal to stones to railroad cars, you name it. They're not real, um, they're not real fussy about it. 
as long as it's kind of sheltered and as long as it's generally a hard surface. So what you see here is a tree and each one of those little blotches is an egg mass. Each of those egg masses is 30 to 50 and it almost looks like a continual run on that tree. And as you can see a little bit more in the background, the next limb up, same thing. There's easily thousands of eggs on that one tree. So if you want to go out and scrape all those, hats off to you. You can scrape them, put them into a bag of alcohol, hand sanitizer to destroy them. Uh, you can just as easily take them and squish them. They pop like zits. It's kind of fun. It's almost like bubble pop, um, bubble wrap popping, except you get the added bonus of a, a gooey finger at the end of it. So some of the things that you're going to hear and see today are, like I said, best, uh, best practice what we know to date. That six foot off the ground, absolutely untrue. And you see on the lift picture, that tree taking it down, there were eggs at, at 70 feet, right up to the top of the tree. Uh, the trees that they tend to feed on, they will lay on. But you see in the middle picture, that's white pine. The reason they're laid on that white pine is there's a maple in the proximity. The females were laying on that maple, dropped off to the pine, and that was a nice sheltered spot to lay those eggs. Now, they will feed on pine, but it's not their preference. I've seen it, I've seen it once. Nothing else was in the area in a new development, and they kind of get caught up in the resin, and it's not a real good meal. But these things will feed on just about anything. And the other statement that was, was made, and, was, and you'll still find out there a lot on the internet, is that they only lay on smooth bark and smooth surfaces. That's not true. You can see the picture with the crag bark on the left. They just need to find a smooth section of that bark to lay those eggs. So going forward, like I said, happy hatch day. Today's only April 25th, but generally in May, they start to hatch out. The egg mass will not hatch entirely. Not all the eggs in a single mass will hatch at once. It's kind of spread out over a nice bell curve. So there'll be multiple hatches out of the same mass over, um, over a period of about two weeks. And when those, those nymphs hatch out, you can see those picked in that picture, there's tiny slits in the eggs. They'll kind of ooze out there, harden off in the air, and then they go right up the tree and start feeding. And they'll go for a lush. They're tiny at this point. Often mistaken, a lot of people think they're being infested with deer ticks. Uh, they, they're that small, pencil point size. And so they'll go up the tree and they'll start feeding on soft tissue, whatever they, they can. If they happen to have hatched out onto a hard surface somewhere else that's not food, they'll drop out and start searching for that food. They gotta get flown, they have to almost constantly feed. Uh, when it's warmer temperatures, 48 hours without food, they start dropping. But cooler temperatures, they can kind of do a diapause. So don't, don't take that 48 hours as a general, as a perfect rule. First through, there's, there's um, four instars that are wingless with this. Uh, the first through third, they're the black with the white spots, and they double in size with each molt. And that molt period, depending on temperatures, is roughly two weeks between stages. And those first through third instars, they're, they're all wingless, but they're just as likely to be found out on any kind of lush perennial material, anything that's got good sap and is soft that they can pierce into and get that, that um, flow out of it. Roses are fantastic, great indicator. If you have roses on a property in the first instars, you can, you can generally bet that you're going to find one or two there, but they're not fussy. They'll eat just about anything that they encounter. And so, one of the, that makes it a real challenge in this early life stages in order to try and kill these things. You can see in this picture, in this one house, June 25th, they were all over the lush growth on the top of the burning bushes. June 27th, I came back to that property, looked again, they were on the climbing hydrangeas in the back. And this goes back to that development picture where I said they got to at the end of 2017. And I'll show you why in a second here, but you're, you're, you're limited options. With something that's this mobile, if you're going to use a systemic on it, the odds of it staying put long enough to, the number of staying put long enough to do, you get that systemic to kill, it's rough. The other thing is climbing hydrangeas. They're wide open flowers. We don't want to kill our pollinators by using systemics on these plants. 
So it just so happened that this house is in a development where Arborjet was out doing experiments. And uh, Dr. Grossman from Arborjet had set up a big experiment using all the street trees, which are all red maple. And those two trees in the pictures, number 979 and 983, we had tagged, we had used sticky bands on just to check population numbers. And come back on July 5th, when we were p removing the sticky bands from the population survey, I couldn't find nymphs. I went to the neighbor's yard there. They have a few wa weed walnut trees, and there, were, there they were. You can see the sticky bands. There's not much at the bottoms of them. There's walnut trees, they're covered. And that brings into the next stage. stage we'll get to in a second. The other thing with the mobility of these nymphs is that it's not just trees. They have the ability to move, they have the ability to use turf, any kind of plant material that they can get a meal from. And the best way I can equate it is, it's a 2 a.m. out working all night, hot dog in a gas station. Nobody wants to eat it, but it's a good meal if you're starving. And so for these guys, they'd prefer to be on something with good flow but one thing we noticed in uh, May 23rd last year was in the middle of that field, there were first instar nymphs. And that is a big distance, 40 meters, for something that can only hop or walk that's the size of a pencil point to get through in two days without taking a meal. And two days is about to cut off without feeding where they start to die. And so we dug some sod up, put them in cages, put nymphs on there, lo and behold, the controls died within 48 hours, and the cages with sod had survival up to 12 days. And a lot of that, I think, had to do with it was hard to keep the turf quality alive without cooking the insects with lights and, and sun in, in the plastic cages. So just because it's not, there's not a tree nearby doesn't mean they're not moving through. They can use lawns, they can use fields, they can use roadsides, as long as there's some kind of flow in there to feed from. And now this is the part of the experiment that we did with Arborjet in this development. 60 some trees treated, and we saw this constant movement. And out in that front along the road, there's not a lot of any kind of understory besides the grass. And we saw this constant movement towards that back wood line. And in that back wood line is walnut and ailanthus. And so we look at those numbers from the, the banding on uh, June 20th, there's pretty good numbers of nymphs caught in that sticky band. July 5th, there's not so much. And those are those two trees out in the front of that development. They weren't there, they moved on. And as they moved on, the numbers started to build in the back of the development. And you can see, now we're at the fourth instars. And you can see the red color, that's the fourth instar. Sometimes people mistake it for box elder beetles. All you have to do is go to touch it, and if it springs away about three feet, you know it's a lanternfly. And so what we realized is that the strongest ones were making that push towards Atlantis, towards Walnut. And two trees about 15 feet apart, Atlantis on the left, Walnut on the right, those are the numbers that start attacking twigs of the trees in the fourth instar. They've molted three times now, they're getting bigger in size, they're noticeable, and their proboscis, their beak, is getting stronger. They can start getting through more than just fleshy material. They can get in on the twigs and feed. And there's a walnut tree completely being attacked, and you start seeing this flagging of the leaves. You can drive down the road and see whole leaves just bright yellow when everything else is green and shiny. You can also see some of the honeydew residue on those pictures. The honeydew being the excrement, it rains out. These guys feed, it goes right through them. They're pretty much passive feeders like an aphid. So the plant pressure puts the sugars in them, comes out the other end, and they don't get all the sugar. So you get this sticky, uh, sugar-rich honeydew that lands on everything beneath them. So in that fourth instar, and the, uh, the adults, uh, they fourth instar then will molt into an adult and they'll start to leave the walnuts and the ailanthus and the dispersal flights begin. Uh, with walnut, it's an early senesce on that tree. They leave it early. Once the phloem is gone in that tree, they're off of it. And that's true through all the species. Walnut just happens to be a little bit earlier than most. And so when it comes time to treat, if a tree's already senesced, 
there's no reason to treat it. The lanternflies aren't going to be feeding on it. But they start to disperse. And at first, the, number, the flights are smaller and smaller. But later on, uh, late August into September, you're going to see those numbers of flights start increasing on warm, dry afternoons. And at that point, they'll fly. And they'll fly in big numbers. And they'll land on anything, houses, cars, people. And this gets back to your customers, the homeowners. When they can't walk out their door without getting pelted in the head with, with crashing lanternflies, uh, you're going to hear about it, and they're going to want to do something about it. And so those periods of good flying weather, they can land on any kind of tree. They can land on Bradford pears. They don't like them. They can land on Quonset cherry. They don't like it. If they get forced to stay there by bad weather, they'll take a meal. They'll move on. So you may have a customer says, this pear tree was covered with them yesterday. That may be. They took a meal. They moved on. It wasn't their favorite. It was the gas station hot dog at 2 a.m. So you're going to have to start paying attention, especially as this is a broadcast to people around the country. The plants in your location, the timings in your location are going to be different from what we have in Pennsylvania. Different plant species, they may find other things that they like quite a bit. So another big thing with these is that the numbers wise, birds don't eat them. They learn to avoid them. Some of the general predators, the praying mantises, the spiders, uh, wheel bugs, assassin beetles, they will, they will kill them and eat them. And a recent study that just came out from South Korea tells us why. They're actually sequestering the toxic alkaloids out of that Atlantis plant and, and using it as protection, very much like the monarchs do with milkweed. And the question then becomes, if they can do it with that, are they doing it with other plants? And that's, that's one that has to be answered. Now, birds aren't eating them. That means we got a lot of numbers. And just to give you a size of an adult reference, it's like a giant aphid. That yellow banding that you see on the abdomen, that's a female. You can tell by the red pythora at the very end on the tip of her abdomen. She's full of eggs at this point. Early on as, as adults, you will not see that yellow banding. Um, but you can see that red underwing, and that's a pretty good um, sight to see and know what you're dealing with as an adult lanternfly. They, the, when the wings are closed, they're the gray with the spots. When those wings open, and it'll be a startle response, or when they're flying, you see that bright red. The feeding volume is huge. And that honeydew, like I said, is sugar rich. The sugars start building up, and a lot of the pollinators, a lot of the honeybees, yellow jackets, they start coming in for the free sugar that's taken out of the plant and being spilled all over the ground. That's also a problem for customers. If you have children, if you have a picnic table underneath a tree, nobody wants to be getting covered with this sugar-rich, sticky honeydew and then have all these wasps and bees coming in on, on it. What comes with honeydew? Sooty mold. Sooty mold is just the black fungus that grows on all kinds of, uh, all kinds of honeydew. Uh, but it gets all over cars. It gets over decks. It gets into Trex decking really bad. Um, but again, the lanternfly has the ability to make those situational adjustments. They're going to take what's first. If they don't get choices one, two, three, they'll go for four, five, six. In the springtime, there's lots of sap. In the summertime, the highest choice of plants. And as we get into fall, some of the trees start to senesce off, and they're going to have to concentrate down onto the ones that hold their leaves the longest. And usually in our area, that's maples. But just to give you an idea, those yellow umbrellas in that development were Dr. Grossman's brainchild to catch um, dead nymphs, dead adults from treated trees as a representative sampling. So you can see early on in May when those umbrellas went out, they were bright yellow. That's the sooty mold and the honeydew underneath and what it looks like come fall. Imagine that all over your car, all over your deck, and it's not the easiest thing to wash off. And so in the fall with the dispersal flights, it's not the greatest of videos, but you'll see that these things just start lifting off into the air. They spread, they move, they go in all directions. Uh, they'll ride a wind current on a good day, and they'll just keep spreading and spreading and spreading. Those particular trees there are Norway maples, not a favorite. And I know that there's a silver maple behind that tree that they really like. They just happen to land on that Norway maple and then take off again. 
Is it worth treating that tree? I don't think so because you're not going to get them to feed there. And this goes back to that practicality and Trent's going to talk a bit about that too with the treatments. So when we, our choice has been using systemics. Dinotefuron is the choice material for the state, uh, for the state of Pennsylvania and the USDA. And Dr. Grossman did some great work with metacloprid injections and had very good uh, effectiveness with that. So when you have these kinds of numbers of trees, you're kind of getting into where you have to use dinotefuron and or not dinotefuron, systemics, and it, it really helps to inject just to keep this stuff, the poison from being out everywhere. The other big thing that you're going to have to do with your customers is get them used to the fact there's nothing anybody can do from spreading onto your, uh, your property. This is one tree, you can see August 5th, the pile just keeps getting bigger and bigger. That tree was treated and that red underneath, that's a sign that they've gotten the ingestion of a dinotefuron treatment. The wings open up, we call it split wing. You know you got them at that point. And just to get an idea of how many um, pile up on the ground, that's it. You see them, they keep coming. They keep coming in waves. They keep coming in waves. And then the pile gets deeper and deeper. And if you have customers who are queasy, you're gonna wanna have to do something with that. Either clean them up, take a blower, spread them out. It starts to stink like rotten carrion, roadkill laying there. Those are the kind of numbers off a single tree. Dinotefuron is a very effective product. If you read the label though, Dinotefuron and its degraded MNG are associated with chemicals detected in groundwater, high water solubility. One of the application methods for Dinotefuron is to soil drench, homeowners are doing it, and where we are, it's a very rural area and a lot of people are in wells. When it says it right on the label that it has groundwater uh, uh, contamination potential, I start to perk up. It tells you right in the label about the restrictions, how much you can use, how much you can treat. Another application method is bark banding. Bark banding is very effective with smaller trees, thinner bark, where the, the material can get into the tree. You get a large silver maple, it has a harder time getting through that exfoliating bark. Uh, another big thing, do not apply to wet bark. For Pennsylvania last year, we had double our annual rainfall, a lot of rain events, and it got difficult to find a dry time to do a bark banding. And the other big thing, don't apply more than 79 fluid ounces of this product per, year, per acre per year. That's not that much when you start treating big trees. That's a nice point where the injection systems from ArborJet are a nice way to get around that because there's no restriction, the chemicals put right into the tree. So that trap tree Atlantis method, we've done this for a couple of customers and what we did was we moved, went in and removed Atlantis, all but those nine blue stars on there. Treated them with dinotefuron, that's what the hillside looked like. You can see the red painted dots up the hillside and that's how we kept track of, of our uh, our trees went back, you had Atlantis, you have to use an herbicide to take the roots out. Um, we went back, treated the stumps with triclopyr when we finished clearing. We treated those, those trap trees. At the same time, we also treated several trees in the yard that we knew were normal potential hosts like the maples. And lo and behold, at the end of September, there was plenty more on the other three maples in the yard. They're covered. So while the trap tree method does work, it's not the end all be all, they will not, it will not get all the Atlantis. Uh, it, treating the Atlantis will not kill all the lanternflies that come onto a property. And so it's an effective method. If you have Atlantis, there's a good chance that it's gonna be a hot host for a portion of the time, of a portion of the life cycle. It's not the end all be all. You're gonna have to do more work than that. Another spot we did the same thing, but the, the work was done by the Department of Agriculture, which is our local high school. And you can see the two red arrows where the Atlantis trees were treated out. Um, and then we went out and sampled with the, with the biology class on all those blue arrows and checked those trees. And lo and behold, 122 maple uh, meters from treated Atlantis that maple next to the baseball stadium had 93 egg masses that we could count from the ground. 
So the Oanthus trap tree method is not going to be your end-all, be-all. Um, as far as injections go and numbers that we're talking about, September 25th, you can go late on maples. As long as that tree hasn't senesced, last year a combined lead 24-inch diameter silver maple at the leading edge of a cornfield. So these guys crossed that cornfield. They may have taken a meal, they may have not, but they got to that first leading edge tree and in the first 24 hours on that tarp, we picked off 2,300 dead adults. Second 24 hours, another 3,300. At the end of seven days, we killed 12,000 lanternflies off that one tree. Most of those females had not laid eggs yet, and that's a good way to do it. If you have a tree that becomes a hot host, then you're gonna to wanna to treat that tree, and, and when these guys focus in on the fall, in the fall, on certain trees, you wanna treat them. How much effect are we really having? Another uh, development that we were taking care of, the yellow stars were all treated trees. The red stars were where we found nymphs the following year. Where the yellow stars were, we could not find any nymphs. The red stars were we had not done treatments. Um, we can have a localized effect for a short term. There was no nymphs the following year local. But as soon as the adult dispersals come, they move right, on, uh, right back in there. And so, are you having an effect? Yes, you're reducing numbers. Are we gonna eradicate this way? We're not gonna spray our way through. We need a lot more research. You know, that's the bottom line. Not all your situations are gonna require a treatment. If you wanna be a con artist, you can be a con artist, um, but your customers are gonna need you year after year with this one. Uh, you're gonna have to observe. Take a look at the property. It may be that the hot host is on the neighbor's property. Maybe suggest to the person who calls you to help the neighbor pay for the treatment if that's what it's gonna take. But this bug is versatile. It will adapt, it doesn't change, it doesn't evolve, but it will make use of the situation that it finds itself in. And in your neighborhoods, in your areas, you're gonna to have to adjust all of this to your climate and your plants. Your customers get freaked out they become uh, very susceptible to unscrupulous people. Maybe not your customers, but general public do. Um, you see that, you see those numbers, people freak out. And so you're gonna see, when this gets to your area, you're gonna see the scam artist start. And I, I just love this ad because the bottom, the bottom circle picture there is a pyrops found in Borneo. I'm guessing it was Google image for plant hopper. It's not even found in the United States. Um, they spell tree of heaven wrong, and this flyer went out to many, many, many people, and they're telling them that they have to treat twice a year with Xylam, which says on the label, one application per site per year. It happens, it's gonna happen, it's gonna continue happening. Uh, get your customers educated, get yourself educated, know what your straight state restrictions are and what you're allowed to do. Where we're going from here, it's the wild, wild west. It's spotted lanternflies are relatively unresearched at this point. Um, we're getting better. There's a lot of research taking place. Penn State is doing a phenomenal job. You can learn more about this through the uh, Penn State Extension website. The <clears throat> uh, USDA and the PDA, unfortunately, are still focused only on Atlantis as of this point. Uh, they're not going to get it that way. They're giving up too much ground and too much of the life cycle. And there's going to continue to be that snake oil sales by unscrupulous people. There was one uh, national uh, extermination company that went door to door and were selling foundation treatments to protect the foundation of your house from spotted lanternflies. Spotted lanternflies can do nothing but tap into trees and plants and eat phloem. They don't bite. They don't sting. They don't do any kind of structural damage aside from the, the uh, secondary sooty mold. So the other thing now we get back to is the trees. What do you need to do? Are you protecting your trees? We've seen this multiple years now where we've had silver maples, mostly some red maples, where they start to push new buds while they're still in full leaf. And that's generally a, that secondary bud push is after a heavy drought chemicals, uh, some kind of herbicide treatment like that, that you'll see that second push in the fall. In this case, we're seeing it as a plant response that maybe the plant's not getting the sugars down to the roots that it needs. Um, 
who knows at this point, but it is concerning. And 2017 and 2018 were record-breaking years for rain, and it helped to mask, I think, a lot of the damage. But this is true tree damage from feeding nymphs. They can bleed twigs down to nothing. Multiple years of this, and I think if we get into a drought, we're going to see a really bad scenario take place. So at that point, you guys have questions? Any questions coming in? Hey, Jake. Yeah, I'm actually listening to the uh, webinar on a little bit of a delay, so I apologize about that, guys. Hey, we got a question from Edgar's. Where's the spotted lantern fly now? Uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, they found them in New York, uh, small populations, uh, New Jersey. Uh, mm -hmm. Delaware's found them. Uh, Maryland has some in some of the counties and an established population in Virginia. Northern Virginia has a well-established population now. They were one of the first outbreaks, probably from eggs shipped from Pennsylvania. Uh, they got there and they got established. So mid-Atlantic right now, my gut feeling is the way that these things move with eggs, there's a very good chance they're in a whole lot more states that just haven't been discovered yet. You guys are arborists, you're in the trees, keep your eyes open. If you do find something that you're not sure, take a picture of it at the very least. If you can, capture it, stick it in a jar of alcohol, contact your local extension or your local Department of Agriculture or the USDA. And if you don't get a response from them, get in touch with us and we'll make sure that somebody gets, gets going on it. Um, early on, if it's a small contained outbreak, there may be a chance to kind of keep it in check if it's dealt with the correct way. What else you got? Uh, Sean Smith is, is basically saying, what systemics are you treating with? And uh, are there any studies on dewaxing agents to cut back on egg mass production that you know of? So the main products that we're using at this point that we're having good success with are imidacloprid and dinotefuron as systemics. Uh, contacts, bifenthrin as an okay residual. Again, it goes back to that mobility. Um, Sectocidal soap is incredibly effective. If you have a pile of them up on one, one plant, one area, insecticidal soap is almost benign and you can kill a lot that way. Um, the second part of the question was? Waxy uh, coverings. Are, are there any studies on dewaxing agents to cut back on egg mass production? There's a lot of studies taking place, including by Arborjet. Dr. Grossman's got trials going on that right now in that same development. And uh, unfortunately, until we get through the hatch, we're not going to know how effective they are. But yes, there are studies going on, and uh, there will be more in the future. So. All right, and uh, John Jacobs is asking, uh, are there, uh, are GDD a, factors, a factor for hatch, hatching at all, or? Growing degree days? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So that hatch that we saw today was on a masonry building, uh, acts as a heat sink, keeps them a little bit warmer. Cooler areas, the north side of a hill, uh, in, in a shadow and valley, you'll see a couple of weeks later. So there's a big difference, just very localized, based on the individual growing degree days that those egg masses are, uh, are exposed to. Yep, what else? Uh, another question is, is, uh, is there any chance that you found better response to straight injection of using Pentra bark to cause uh, bacill applications? Pentra bark. As a bark spray, is that, I guess, because we, Pentra bark you wouldn't inject. You, you wouldn't would, inject you it. You would bark spray. We would use, you would use it uh, with your dinotefuron bark banding. And yes, we do use it. It says it to use it on, on some of the labels. Um, and again, it goes back to uh, the thickness of the bark and um, how, what the diameter is, the amount that you're putting on there. You get into a, a real quirky bark like a willow, and a willow can be a hot host. It's tough to get that material in there, absorbed into the tree. Uh, but yeah, we do use Pentra bark, and it helps, I believe. Yep. Another question, you talked a little bit about you know, how they can just hitchhike on to uh, uh, 
trains and cars and all kinds of things. You might have mentioned it, but uh, we have a viewer that wants to hear it again. How, how far can an adult travel and, uh, in its mobile life cycle? Uh, that's, that's the million dollar question right now. Yeah. Uh, m based on what we've seen with our customers, we believe the natural spread is somewhere in the five to seven miles a year um, that they're, they're, they're easily flying. It's very difficult to track these guys because once they're up in the air, you lose sight of them. Uh, they're small, so it's tough to track them with any kind of uh, telemetry that, that you, you would use on a bird or something like that. Although it's getting closer to doing, doing that kind of experiment, I believe some of the researchers are working on. Uh, the, the problem also for us last year was that wet weather keeps them grounded. So it makes artificial um, outliers of how far they may have moved last year compared to previous years and, and to that effect. But um, best guess, five to seven miles. I've seen them clear a quarry um, coming in well above uh, the, the rim of the quarry. So I'm going to guess that on a good updraft, mile, mile and a half is not an issue if the conditions are right. Um, I, I, it's a guess, the best guess. But based on what I've seen on a good flight, good updrafts, they're moving at least a mile. And you talked about today being hatch day as opposed to what time was it last year and, and what's the contributing factor to that? I think the biggest contributing factor to that is last year in Pennsylvania we had snow the first week of April and it's been warmer this year uh, at, at this point through April. The fact that that building was being heavily scrutinized, that it was seen, and it's a heat sink. Um, there's there's uh, uh, air exchangers there for the heating uh, HVAC system, which may artificially warm the side of that building as well. So adding the degree days to those eggs, um, I think. So mostly it's just a climate thing and localized microclimate. It's just like when we're, we're planting trees, if you're up against the wall, it can cook. Um, it, can, it can really make a difference. So eggs laid on the side of masonry got an earlier start. That, that's what it was. And it was documented, well documented uh, with pictures. Again, if you find it, you think you found it, if you can't collect it, snap a picture of it and get it to somebody who needs to know. Um, but document, always document it. And then you, you can take those pictures as well, right? Absolutely. Well, if you, give them your address. Uh, my website is spottedlanternfly.com, and uh, you can always reach out to me through there. Uh, if It won't be necessarily me that's going to take that information, but we will get it to the right person. Um, in your, it, it we'll get it to the right people who need to know for your area and to confirm or not confirm if it is spotted lanternfly. So... And I know here in the Midwest, a lot of folks are uh, dealing with the uh, Emerald Ash Bore yeah. Midwestern area. Are, can you speak to the differences between the two and, and what's, you know, what's, what makes them uh, horrible in their own respects? <laughs> I, I think the big difference for the spotted lanternfly is the amount of tree species that it attacks. You know, 70 plus species of trees. Uh, where the emerald ash borer is just going after ash trees. So uh, big difference on how many species that it's attacking. It's more of a nuisance pest with the honeydew and black city mold, which is going to be an issue for a lot of the customers. Um, and the other thing that we haven't talked about is what if this spotted lanternfly gets a disease or something like that that can go into a tree, like yeah. uh, if southern pine beetle has pithy or the blue stain. You know, yeah, those are it, the things we, we don't know. It, it's, it's not the mosquito bite that kills you, it's the malaria that it's putting in. And these guys, they're poking in they're, and, and they're passively feeding. Um, there's a very good chance that they could pick up a virus or, or a bacterial issue that would have gone pretty much unknown. Uh, but because of the mobility of these adults from species to species, individual tree to tree in a single lifetime, the potential to spread a, a, a disease, a virus, a pathogen, it, it is incredibly high. And that makes it scarier. We're just starting to see the full brunt of the emerald ash borer in Pennsylvania and eastern Pennsylvania now. And uh, 
funny enough, the lanternflies don't tend to like the ash trees, so they have that going for them. But uh, mm -hmm. the, the ash borer is taking care of the, the rest of them. So um, in terms of it's not an outright death, but it's a, uh, it's a nuisance species, and the potential is huge. Uh, and one other main thing that I didn't talk to, uh, because this is for arborists, these things absolutely love grapes. It doesn't matter if it's wild grapes or in a vineyard. Vineyards are seeing complete death of their vines in two to three years, no production. If you're a wine drinker, bad news. Uh, wild grapes through, through old fence rows, you can drive down the road and see where the lanternflies have actually killed them in the trees. Uh, a little bit of relief for the trees, but they absolutely love grapevines, and that is a huge concern. Uh, Pennsylvania, I believe, is the fourth largest grape producing state in the country. New York is a huge grape producer in the Great Lakes region, and uh, if this thing gets out into the California wine valleys, it is going to be a absolutely devastating pest. So, yeah, that's and I, I know Sean Smith was talking about how. EAB can hit up fringe trees in the south, and then you're seeing uh, EAB over in the Pennsylvania area, so uh, definitely intermingling. Absolutely, yep. Uh, they, don't, they don't seem to bother each other. They're, they're going right around each other, very polite that way. Yeah. Uh, Austin Montgomery wants to know, is biocontrol through known predators an option for mitigation? So, you wanna take that one? Yeah, so essentially they're, they're working on it, uh, but it's going to take 10 years before the trials are done because we can't have these uh, biocontrols attack other insects that we have here. So they're in the process of it, but you know, five, 10, at least 10 years. And they're going to have to study it well before they're going to release a new, a new insect to try and control, you know, the one that's already here accidentally. Um, but there are, there are parasitic wasps in its own ra home range that, that will take out uh, the eggs. So, there's some hope. The, the problem is the speed with which it's spreading. Now, I know that you said if you see uh, you know, one in your area, take a picture, try to get a sample, and of course, send them to your website or, or another. U uh, USDA, your local extension office. Right. If those people have never heard of it, keep going, don't give up. And, and if you have to, give us a call and we'll make sure that somebody gets, gets the wind of it to, to find out. And John Jacobs was wanting to know, is that basically, how, how can you uh, map the advancement of territory with them? Is, is it through the extension? And yeah, PDA has been doing a lot of that. For, for me personally, it's just my home range where, we, where my business is running. Uh, we watched it spread uh, to new customers further away from, from the ground zero. And that's, that's where we got our spread natural from. Uh, it generally, it's encompassed our entire territory now that we work out of. So it's um, it, it's a it's a uh, it's a ubiquitous. It's just there. Yeah. Is that the best thing to do when it comes to mapping them? Is for those out in the field? Is is get that information in the right hand? Ab absolutely. Get a pinpoint. Get a pinpoint. Know where it was. If you encounter it at a picnic on a Sunday in a park make sure you document that it was at that park and not at your home office or, or something to that effect. But that's really what USDA, uh, Penn State Entomology, uh, uh, they're all working on all this with modeling and trying to predict where it's going to go based on the availability of food and climate and whatnot. Um, in Pennsylvania right now it's univoltine, one generation per year, egg to adult. When we get below the freeze line south with this, we don't know if it's going to die out or it's just going to start being multiple generations. Frost is what takes it out in Pennsylvania, heavy freeze. Um, so that's, uh, you know, if you find it, let the right people know. That's not my job. <laughs> that's, that's the government agencies. Right. A couple more questions and then we got to go to break. Yep. Uh, Stephen Collins wants to know, um, is the uh, spotted lanternfly worse than the Japanese beetle? Absolutely more obscene in terms of numbers, the honeydew. Japanese beetles tend to go up and down, cycle in waves, uh, at least where we are. They can do some damage, the grubs can do some damage, but everything recovers. Spotted lanternfly gets to the point where um, it's present as an adult 
for such a long period of the year that people start to dread having a, a picnic. They start to dread grilling in their backyard. Uh, it, you can't, literally can't walk out of the house some days without getting pelted by them. Uh, they don't land well, they crash land. And uh, it's, it's just become a way of life where you just automatically swat, crush, drop it on the ground. Don't even look, you know what it was. Sitting at a soccer game or a baseball game on the sidelines, that's what it becomes in your neighborhoods. It's, uh, it's just a really um, bad, bad scenario just in the numbers of them. And they're big, they're so much bigger. And the population, I think the population is so much higher than Japanese beetles. Um, and I mean, it, it's moving. I mean, they're laying 30 to 50 eggs in one sack. And I mean, you saw from your pictures, you know, there was probably a thousand new hatch just just on those branches on that branch. in the video. Yeah. Just imagine forced. Of so that. you imagine all those hatching out, and they're on the move through your property, mm -hmm. and and it's just it's a, it's a problem. There is some damage to the plants. There's a good amount of damage. The disease issue. Um, you know, it's, it's not a good thing. Okay, final question, uh, at least for this segment before we go to break. Matt Derrickson is asking, do these have the potential to affect oaks with the current oak wilt issues in some parts of the country? So generally, again, everything's gonna go back to proximity. If there's only an oak to feed on, they'll feed on that oak. They generally don't like those harder, more dense trees, oak, hickory, those kind of trees. However, what we did see in 2017 was that we had a very late uh, first frost to the point where the maples had actually senesced and these guys were still alive, still feeding, and the last trees in our area that lose their leaves were the oaks and the uh, hickories. And they, we did see a move to them. I don't think it was for long enough to do a great amount of damage, but they generally don't attack oaks as a primary unless they don't have another choice. So, yeah, in terms of bacterial leaf scorch, I, I don't know the connection. Is it possible to vector it? I don't think that's officially been, been worked out yet, too, how that's vectored. So, yeah, I don't, I don't, that's the best thing I can say. They generally don't touch on, don't, don't host on oak, but um, not to say they won't. Okay, great question so far. Thank you everyone for contributing. Uh, we are going to take a break and then Trent is going to uh, talk a little bit about the spotted lanternfly from Arbor Jet's point of view. We'll be right back everyone, don't go anywhere. It has completely changed the way I operate. Like my life has improved significantly. It gave me a direction to go in. Every day is a challenge and every day just keeps building me up and up. It's great. I love it. I get to touch living beautiful trees every day. I work outside. It got me away from a lot of uh, bad extracurricular activities, you know, and helped me mature in life. Not only did it give me my ethics and work, it taught me to appreciate the finer things uh, that are out there in nature and, you know, everything I have in life actually started somehow with tree care, including meeting my wife. I'm Carson with TreeStuff.com, and I'd like to ask you to take a second to learn about the Fallen Families Fund. It's a charity created to provide small cash donations to families who have been affected by the death or injury of a working arborist. All of the administrative costs are covered by Cheryl Inc., so 100% of your contribution goes to help families in their time of healing and recovery. You can learn more and donate at www.fallenfamiliesfund.org. Have you heard about trio caching? Like geocaching, it's a real-world hunt using GPS coordinates to find the trio cache plaque. Share your adventure on social media and you can win some sweet prizes. See who else has visited the cache in the digital logbook and have a blast. There are more than 85 amazing trio cache locations in 15 different countries to satisfy your thirst for adventure. Head to treestuff.com slash cache to get started then grab your gear, find the tree, climb it, and claim victory. Welcome back. 
Uh, let's get going about combating the spotted lanternfly and get into a little bit more about uh, pesticides and some of the pictures that I have uh, that Brian's taken some of them and uh, Dr. Don. Uh, a little bit about field support for you guys when you get out there. Uh, I am covering the mid-Atlantic Pennsylvania all the way down to Virginia. Uh, Kevin Brewer would be New York on up into Maine and then Kevin Lewis would be your Midwest guy. So, um, and if you get down in the southeast, when it gets down there, J.B. Torish. So, um, and the rest of the team out west, uh, Jeff Palmer and that. Uh, quick Jet Air. This is the device that is perfect for spotted lanternfly injections. You're injecting a small amount. It's compressed air. It easily goes into the tree. Uh, I'll be back in a month and actually be demonstrating this device in the field so we can see it. But... This is the tool that Brian uses to go out. This is what most people are doing. It's convenient. You can inject right out of the container. Uh, so it's very fast and efficient in that sense. Um, and it's um, quick. I mean, that's the main thing, guys. You want speed. You're doing a lot of trees. Uh, Brian covered a lot of this. But as we said, you know, it's in Virginia. Uh, we found specimens in New Jersey, Delaware, and, and some in New York now. But it's on 70 plus host species. You know, we're going to talk a little bit about grapes coming up. Uh, eggs can be laid on any surfaces, whether it's trains, uh, train cars, trucks, you know, people at a casino, they could be sitting in the car, uh, races, you know, if there's a racetrack near the area, they could be landing in the trailers and then moving. You know, these are all ways of doing it. Uh, it's mainly a nuisance, you know, uh, what we talked about it, but we're going to talk about control options and all that coming up. Uh, native to Asia. So it was found in China, uh, Indonesia, it's been in Korea. Um, it was an invasive in Korea, <clears throat> South Korea. Invasive. It and walked it, right through it. And it destroyed their, their, grape, uh, their grape? grape production wow. in, in a matter of years. Yeah. So we know that came on probably pallets, you know, and we're going to talk about that. Eradication did not happen. You know, that, that was the plan in the beginning, right? Brian talked about, it. we're going to eradicate it. Now we're trying to compress it, stop it, suppress it. We're not, we're not going to stop it. We need to be proactive now. We need to find these new finds and be proactive and take care of it before it gets out of hand. Uh, <clears throat> we know about the states. We know that we found them in Delaware and Maryland, but we don't see a significant population. But if they're there, they're building. You know, people aren't looking for this pest. We need to be looking for it. Uh, we need to be proactive. <clears throat> Brian showed you these pictures, but let's get into this now. So this is the egg masses. You know, up close you can see in the picture there uh, an egg mass, one laying next to it. Um, you see how pretty they are in that sense, in the nymphs to the red and to the adults. Birch tree, river birch. They love river birch. It's a big problem, you know, there's lots of river birches, but look how that blends into the bark of the tree there in that picture, guys. This is going to be hard to find. You really have to be looking for it and, and, and noticing it and paying attention. So if you're out walking to start looking for these things, if they said it's in the area because it's probably there and we need to find it. Uh, <clears throat> here's a silver maple, but look how hard it is to find, guys. Look at the pictures blown up, the three circles. You know, some of those eggs have hatched and that they're there, but you don't see it. It blends into the tree. If you don't know what you're looking at, guys, and I can tell you when I went out with Brian, I couldn't find them. I was like, where are they? And then you start seeing them and I'm like, oh wow, it's the whole branch. It's completely covered as the video shown. So these are the things that we're seeing when we're out there that you guys need to be looking for. Um, here, silver maple underneath the bark. How are you gonna see that? A homeowner's not gonna see that unless the nymphs are coming out there's no way you could spray or do a dormant oil spray to, to get that. It, it's protected. They're um, protecting the way their uh, eggs are gonna hatch. <clears throat> so this gets into the life cycle though and explains it to you guys, you know. You've got eggs October to June, they may start in September, but you're gonna get your hatch in first instar. But looking at it guys, it, it was a lot sooner. It was April. We had the first hatch. I mean, it was a microclimate, but you know, it's not supposed to happen until May or June. So is this early spring gonna speed things up? Yeah, in some areas it may, it when may. You, when you get further south and, it, and it's warmer, you have to adjust your timelines. 
So in Virginia, they may be in Hatch already. You know, that, that would be an interesting thing to go down and see. And, and I'm, I'm going to do that, guys, and I'll try to keep you updated with that uh, when I come back. Uh, so you can see the instars and then the red when it really gets particular. And then you have your adults, July, December. So Brian showed good pictures of this. So you can see with the male uh, on the top and the female on the bottom. Uh, he showed you the red uh, tip on the abdomen. But Here's molting. This is pretty cool. I, I was with Brian uh, when, when this molting happened. He actually held one in his hand and it was amazing. Within 10 minutes, guys, it molted from the fourth instar into adult and could fly. I mean, it was like, it was yeah. literally over 30 minutes it, it came out. It was kind of paralyzed in his hand and then it started flying away. So it's relatively quick once this molting starts and happens. But I just wanted to show you guys what that looks like and how, how fast it can go. Yeah, that, that color changes uh, 10, 15 minutes and, then, and you, that pink and orange goes away and you'll, you'll, it'll look like a regular adult. So why is it different? Exponential reproduction. Uh, the ability to attack all these different hosts is big. Uh, Brian talked about no general predators. His chickens wouldn't eat it. Right. They, they won't do it. So when birds avoid it, that's a big deal. You know, and a female's laying 30 to 50 eggs. So let's look at the population gain, all right? Let's just assume that there was one egg mass that hatched, you know, early in 2012 on that pallet. You know, it wasn't identified till 2014, but it was probably there for a couple of years because we didn't notice it. You know, look at the numbers, guys. Look, look how many actually could be here. I mean, it's staggering them out. And, that, and that, those, that 17 number is assuming that the number of is half female from the eggs. So double that six trillion number at the bottom puts us at 12 trillion with the males included in there. And that's if it was one egg mass from the start. Exactly. And the thing that we have to keep in mind, guys, is nothing is happening in the forest. We're not treating out there. It, it, it is running wild. It is spreading. You know, there's Alanthus, there's black walnuts. I mean, black walnut is heavy in, in the Pennsylvania forest. So I mean, yep. These areas that are going unchecked, it's just moving. So, so how far is it moving? How fast is it moving in those areas? These are all questions. Take a look at the trees. See how thick that population is up and down those trees. Uh, different egg masses on the right. Uh, this is a feeding on the branch, guys. They do, they love Atlantis. They love uh, black walnut. Anything with that toxic uh, sap is what they're going after. You know, does it speed them up? You can see different instars, so it may help speed up that process. We don't know. Th those are the research things that we need to see, but we need you guys out in the field taking notes, seeing different things that happen because yep. him and I talk on the phone once a week and we bounce off ideas and we see what's happening. Being proactive and having these discussion guys, we can get ahead of this pest. We can figure out things that we don't know. If you're seeing something different where you are when it gets to you, let us know. Keep, keep the conversation going. Yeah. Pictures, you know, th this, you know, on the left, you see the adult with the fourth instar. You, you can see how um, it does look like a box elder bug in some things, but man, when it jumps on you, you don't think it is anymore. And what a nuisance when you get a thousand of these guys jumping at you around the tree. And as Brian showed on his pictures, they love perennials. Oh, wow. we were there and we saw them on sunflowers in the garden. I mean, they will literally go wherever the food source is. And, and that's what it is. It's about what's available to them. You know, they, they haven't been on oaks. I really haven't seen them on sugar maples that much either because they're after the red or silver maples. So these are all things that we're seeing out there for you guys to know about. Um, just some different photos that Dr. Don took uh, of what it looks like in the past. Uh, sticky band control, you know, it, it does work, but it can fill up so fast. And the other thing is you get a lot of bycatch. Uh, last year, there was a hawk caught in sticky bands. We've seen squirrels, uh, songbirds, things like that. There are safer sticky bands available online uh, where you can just wrap it with chicken wire to keep the mammals and the birds off. But far and away, you're getting a lot of beneficial insects too. So there's an upside and downside to everything. So host plant range. You know, we really don't know all of it yet because it, it keeps expanding. And as it goes south, we're gonna see what it does in the warmer climates, you know? And as Brian said, will we have two life cycles? We don't know that yet. Uh, what plants will it take? Will, will it go after palms, you know, as we get down into the Carolinas more? All these things are, are, are gonna be interesting. 
But what I can tell you from what I've seen going out with Brian and that is it loves the most vigorous and healthy plants out there. The healthier the tree, the more likely it's to go after. I, I, I don't see it going after stressed trees, you know. If the tree's stressed, it's not as likely to go to it. Um, and, and the sap loss is so heavy. Essentially, you know, if it's sunny out and they've left, it could be raining honeydew on you. And then it goes cloudy and it stops. So these are some of the things that, that we've seen so far. Uh, best time management practices. This is what Penn State's put out there. You know, they're saying January through May to destroy the egg masses, October through December, all, all those would be that. They're giving you times for your uh, sticky bands, uh, registered insecticides. You know, what we're going to tell you from the data that we saw, we're going to say mid-July and uh, mid-June into July is when you're really going to start doing your injections to yeah, be uh, here, most here. effective. Yeah. Uh, you, you really want to make sure those systemics are in the trees before the egg laying period. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Like before the adult period. And, and what we're going to show you too is, you know, you're going to want to treat the tree of heaven earlier in the season because that's when they're feeding on it. And black it, walnut. And black walnut. And then as the season goes on, you're going to count on your silver maples, your red maples, and the other trees that are River out birch, there. Willow. Room. Yep. All those. So he talked a lot about movement, but you know, they're hitchhiking. You know, egg masses are going on rusty objects, uh, train cars, uh, water heaters, you know, trash, anything like that. Whatever is in the area they could be Scaffolding on. Scaffolding against the building gets picked up and moved to the next job and there's, there could be egg masses stuck to the metal. Absolutely. Yep. So look before you leave, monitor these things. These are all ways to keep uh, an eye out for it. Um, site conditions. You know, what are you going to do when you walk up to the property? I think Brian and I talk about this the most. You're going to identify what, what might be a hot tree. Is there a large silver maple? Is there a river birch? Uh, is there a ton of willow trees or, or, or willow bushes? What's going to be the hot plant? Yep. Uh, what needs to be treated? How many trees are there? Could you go off label if you're doing bark sprays uh, or, or, or soil not, drenches? It's, it, it's very easy to do. So the application choices are out there were bark sprays, soil drenches, injections, foliar sprays. These are all tools in your toolbox, but we're going to talk about what's effective and we're going to show you the research uh, that Brian and Don did too today. Um, grapes. Look at this, guys. This is uh, courtesy of PA Extension and Department of Ag, what they've seen. After a year of attack, they saw a 90% loss in yield. So this is a big deal now. We're getting into agricultural, you know. And, and if I can just make it really serious for a minute, they apparently go after hops pretty well too. Well, if you're a beer drinker, it got real serious. Th 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 it's a big deal. Apple trees, you know. Um, Brian has said though they kind of fly through the orchards. They're they're yeah. not uh, hitting it heavily, but that's definitely going to cause damage. It's going to cause damage, and it, the other thing is, if you have to harvest those apples, you have to be very careful. You're not shipping lanternflies with the apples. You have to be careful that you can't go spray right at the day of harvest to take care of those. Um, you know, generally in a big monoculture uh, apple orchard, it's going to be tough for these guys to get through without stopping to feed. Again, we go back to their feeding, they're doing damage. Their sooty mold growing on apples, you've got an unsaleable apple. If you have a disease starts moving and there's plenty of diseases that hit orchard fruit, now we've got a bigger problem. In general, it's not their preferred choice, but it comes down to what's available. Absolutely. And so they will, they will take the meal. So we're seeing this established population move in waves. As, as Brian talked about, you know, if it's a dry, warm day, guess what? They're moving. Uh, I, I've had arborists call me that they've been called to a homeowner's house and they said their, their tree's covered. And when the arborist shows up the they're day, gone. it's gone. Yeah. But then the next day, they're back. So, so they're moving, they're migrating to properties, they travel in groups, uh, they like fresh, fresh locations, they like to go feed on something that's new, but they'll come back, you know. Uh, we're, we've talked about preferred host, Alanthus, Walnut, Silver Maple, River Birch, Red Maple, Willows, all these are what you look to be a hot tree. It's not saying that they're going to not go after an oak tree, but these are what they're preferring in Pennsylvania right now. It, it could change as we move into different areas, but this is what we know so far. Um, so we know what hot trees will be and we'll show you some pictures of that. And this continues through October into the cooler temperatures. Hot trees guys, take a look at this. 
this is pretty severe damage to these trees. I mean, think, you've, what, 2014? So we're five, five years in. You know, how much attacks like this can these trees take? We've had a lot of water the last couple of years. So if we have a drought, are we going to see decline in these trees? What, 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 how much is it going to be? So keep that in mind. Let, let, let's monitor this. Let's see what happens. Uh, do we need to save the tree? You know, Brian talked about this. You know, 48,000 in three months. That's a big deal, guys. I mean, look at the trees, how, how they're being attacked. I mean, it, it, th this is a problem. Think if your kids walk up on that and they fly at them at the tree. It, it's a nuisance. It, it, it's just something that, that, that's definitely a problem. I, I think it's very concerning uh, with the picture of the, the tree having different budding, you know, in the fall. That, that, that's a concern. Why, why is it doing that? You know, that there wasn't anything to cause that other than the feeding. Ah, so insecticide choices, injections of metacloprid, dinotefuron. You know, we've had great research with metacloprid and it working, and, and it's lasted the longest. Bark sprays, they've been effective, guys, but if you do it too early, they're not giving you that full season. And, and as much rain as we have, it, it could be running through the plant faster than we hope. So uh, watch your label limits and that. Uh, we ha have tried some amectin benzoate with our triage and G4, and we have not seen a effect to see. Uh, we do have a new product, R10, uh, that we're launching now that has shown some uh, promise on that. So we will keep you posted on that as we do more research this year. Uh, th this is the link for the USDA. If you want to go see what their research shows, uh, I just wanted to share that with you guys. Uh, it's a great tool and something to look at at, at the different properties of what they've shown. Uh, and now to kind of get in what Brian and Dr. Don uh, did on these with two different sites. Uh, <clears throat> it's kind of interesting what we've found out so far. Uh, so one was in Limerick and the other one was, uh, we'll get to it, it was in the quarries um, in the areas. Yep. yep. So trial one, guys, we did an HOA. We did 60 red maples uh, and, and what we and were trying. 60 yellow umbrellas. 60 yellow umbrellas that no one messed with for a season, it so looked, it's quite it impressive. It looked like a modern art installation driving into the neighborhood. It was, it was pretty neat. Yep. So treatment-wise, we did uh, azduractin, we did our emectin benzoate, uh, we did our uh, artem, we did a metacloprid, we did the experimental uh, products uh, there, and we did some botanical oils, and then we had our checks. <clears throat> so what we were testing, guys, is, is a bowl, essentially that eight foot where that red line is. We were drawing a line, and, and that was the area we were monitoring and seeing what uh, the pest did and how it reacted to that. But look at the black uh, sooty mold and the honeydew dripping down that tree. I mean, it's pretty severe. That, that's a big issue. And if that was a homeowner's tree, they're not gonna take that because that's gonna be a mess on the deck, the patio, cars, which we'll show you pictures coming up. Um, so these are the famous umbrellas again. Uh, he got a little more creative on the second one with the, the two by two uh, mats, but we were able to count how many uh, dead lanternfly were there, and, and it was quite helpful. So essentially, we had black uh, cups there, and we were trying to measure the amount of uh, sooty mold. But as you can see with the umbrellas, uh, it was a problem. It was a mess, it, it, and it was very hard to find in. And I think one of the neat things when I was there helping with research is watching the ants carry the nymphs out. You know, the dead nymphs, they, they were trying to carry that yeah, out. Yeah, they kind of skewed our results a little bit. The ants would come in and pick up a dead nymph and pull it away, carry it out of the umbrella. Yeah. So, but you can see the difference, uh, how the effectiveness of the treatments and where the checks were, they were completely black. Um, so we, we definitely saw some uh, good results with that. Uh, look at these egg masses, though, how thick they are on the tree. I mean, it's quite concerning. You've got a new one versus the old one. Uh, you've got the lanternfly laying it. I, I mean, this to me is a big deal because think how many trees are out there that aren't getting treated, whether it's on uh, municipal property or in the, the forest areas. I mean, you talking about at the high school, you yeah. know, uh, you, you, you tried to treat and there's still that many egg masses. So this is a big concern, guys. We, we need to be proactive. We need to be out inspecting for this pest. Uh, and try to get it before it gets out of hand in these new areas. Because I think Brian could say it, it, it's a nightmare. Yep. It, it's not getting any better. We're just um, putting a Band-Aid on it. Yep. 
Uh, so these are just kind of uh, the mean numbers of showing what was dead. Uh, you, you see the effectiveness of the imidacloprid injections. Uh, the experimental P uh, was okay. Uh, the EB2 had some results in that sense. And then you see the untreated, uh, untreated check. So, <clears throat> and, and I will say the azdirectin or the azosol in some of the injections Brian and I did early in the season did help disrupt uh, the egg lane, which I think is key, yeah. uh, which is an Omri product. So th those options are out there if you have your customers that don't want to use synthetics in that sense. That may be a good choice if you have a flowering plant, mm -hmm. use the azadiractin, it's a feeding disruptor. Absolutely, Yeah. absolutely. Uh, and this gets into the red, uh, the number of live, what we were seeing, uh, and certain products weren't effective. And that may be because it, it didn't have enough time to get in there, and some things uh, were so-so. So this is the level of sooty mold on the cups attached. Uh, the entry to check, uh, when we were monitoring this, we really didn't see a big difference uh, from that other than the uh, botanical oils and that were a little bit higher in that sense, uh, but there wasn't much difference in this study here. Uh, this is going into the limerick, uh, the entry to check the egg masses. You can see that uh, it was lower. Most products were all lower in that sense in the number of mean versus the untreated. Uh, late summer, this is trial number two, uh, which he did in Douglasville, Birdsboro, and South Reading, correct, at, at, at uh, quarry sites. And th this was all Alanthus, guys. Uh, we wanted to see, is Alanthus the problem? You know, if we take care of Alanthus, are we going to stop the issue? So uh, we did eight trees, uh, one of nine treatments, correct. Uh, we did acephate, uh, acephate plus uh, the azosol, azdiractin, uh, the amectin benzoate, imidacloprid, uh, an experimental product. And then we did a bowl spray of imidacloprid and some uh, experimental bowl sprays, and then the check. Um, and then when I think they came in and did an additional eight and we added in uh, another Dynatefuron and experimental because we wanted to see what all products were doing and, and get the feedback. Uh, so what we saw was the imidacloprid was very effective and the Dyna was very effective as an injection. So you, you get that idea on Alanthus, uh, what, what works and what doesn't work. And one, of the, one of the things I just want to add in here is as Trent was saying, certain trees become hot, and that can be within the same species. You can have, you know, 10 red maples, say, in a row, and maybe number three and number five, the most vigorous trees, become the, quote, hot trees that they're, that they're picking. So when we're laying out these experiments, it's kind of hard to try and pick ahead of time what's going to be the hot tree, although we did try and keep it as, as uniform as possible. That's another problem with this bug. It makes up its own mind. It's not like the ash borer where it's going to every ash. It, this, this bug makes some funny choices sometimes. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, getting into the mean level of the sooty mold cups, uh, it was tough. We didn't see that much of a difference in, in this, but with the uh, injections of metacloprid and that, it was lower. And the thing you gotta remember with Atlantis guys is they senesce early, so they're not on there. So you're not gonna have uh, the mess of them feeding as much later in the season. Uh, here's the efficacy. You can see the image at how we don't have any uh, honey mold where the untreated is. So that shows you that we're reducing the honeydew and sooty mold, which that's what your customers are going to want to see. They do not want to see that nuisance pest. So they, don't, they don't want their decks being covered with honeydew and sooty mold. They do not. They do not. So that, that is definitely a big difference in that. Um, looking at this, this is the egg masses. We definitely did see a reduction with injections of that on the egg masses. But the other thing you got to keep in mind, guys, is they're not really on Atlantis at that time, and they're not laying eggs on that. Yeah. So ju just keep that in mind. Uh, they're they're going to be on your silver maples or whatever trees still have leaves at that time. Yep. Uh, so overall effectiveness, guys, uh, th this is the list. Uh, we went through and we tested it. Uh, you see the goods, the excellence. Uh, when we attended the spotted lanternfly, we did get a metoclopid or imaget as the uh, good treatment and excellent control. And th that's what we're after, guys. We're trying to get you products that are very effective and work. So this is a good list to take a look at what options there are. Uh, so what we've seen so far, you know, 
Once they become fourth end stars, that's when they start to jump trees. They start to leave your Lanthus, black walnuts, and sumacs. And that's when you really want to start going out to start injecting these trees to kill the adults. I, I don't think it's worthwhile to try to go out and kill the nymphs unless you're going to do a spray of that sense. But they're always moving, so how effective could you be? And you've got to worry about your pollinators and stuff like that when you're spraying flowering, perennials, and stuff like that. Um, so we're going to say early July is the time to treat. Uh, and we're going to be basing that on, we're reducing sooty mold, we're, we're killing the adults um, in that sense. And, ma and making sure that the treatment lasts through the egg laying period. Through or, the season. Through the season. That, that, that is the main thing. You don't want to apply a, a bark spray in May and not have it last the season and be done by September. That, that's an ineffective treatment, you know. And, and as Brian said, you have ads that are saying, Two treatments a year you can't do that 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 is off label, off label. Th and that's a problem so those are our conclusions so far on that um, acknowledgments to the homeowners and heritage ridge and andy curtis the h and k group and brian he did a lot of work and, and spent a lot of time uh, with dr don out there and we were able to get good results and good data which which we don't have and now we have some of that data and it's going to grow and continue to get better for you guys um, this is just to kind of show you the bark banding, guys. As it got closer to the neighborhood and away from the street, you can see how the nymphs moved. And I mean, they were literally walking across each other to get up that tree. So are they using that for protection because they're not really feeding on it? They're, they're going into the grass, and they you may, know? And they may be feeding on it. it we, we don't know why don't. They, they go up trees and they drop out. We don't know why. So much more that we need to learn yet. It is. And the other thing, too, is these adults, they, they don't really pull from the tree. They're, they're softening it with their saliva and using the trees, the pressure, tr the transfer, the turgor internal, pressure to turgor, pull it yeah. out. Yeah. So a healthier tree is going to have higher turgor pressure, and that's why they're going after it. Yep. So we have two double E's uh, for Imaget uh, and Imaget 10 guys in New York, Delaware, New Jersey, Maryland, uh, Virginia. Uh, and we'll expand as we need it and, and as we see it um, progress. Uh, just some photos, guys, showing you what it looks like attack and after attack. I mean, as Brian's video showed, I mean, you've got handfuls of lanternfly. So keep that in mind that homeowners are going to want that removed and you need to either decide if you're going to blow that when you're there or if you're going to charge another fee to come back and do cleanups. Uh, because they do smell it and, and, and it's going to be an issue. So keep all these things in mind, guys, uh, when you're pricing out these treatments. And, you know, if you're going to say we're, we're not coming back to do cleanup, then put that in your contract. And tell the homeowner to at least take a, a blower and break them up, disperse them so they don't become a wet mass to rot. You know? I mean, this just shows you how serious it is, guys. I mean, just imagine that tree goes up and down with lanternfly. I mean, it, it, you, you it's can treat scary. that tree, and that tree will fill up several more times through the season. And that kind of level of attack, if it's left unchecked, they're bleeding these trees down. We are seeing right. dieback, and it's, and it's very difficult to say scientifically that the feeding caused that dieback in that tree. But I think it's a safe bet to say that if I went and donated blood every week something is going to take me out and it's going to open these trees up to to other problems other pests other pests other pests um you know just nice photo of what they look like up close uh quite a sight you know but war colors you know th things stay away from that um what happens if if they move on or when they move on you know there was tulip poplar scale outbreaks in that area were they the cause of it because they stressed the trees i can guarantee you every tulip poplar in the area had scale yeah. so so we, we could not find last year a tulip poplar without scale in the in the lanternfly region and and so what caused that spread and that consistency of a scale outbreak that I've, I've seen scale before i've never seen that level of scale that consistent before so oh, the, the question brian i had is the lanternfly moving you know, and, and we see research that it can be moved by birds and other insects. So why couldn't it move on a large aphid? You know, it, it, it's possible. The timing is right. We, we, we have to study it. You know, these are questions we have to ask. Uh, look at the honeydew on the cars, though, guys. I mean, this is a real issue. 
your, your homeowners, your customers are not going to be okay with that. The powdery uh, mildew on the tree. I mean, these are all, and I mean, that scale is thick. Yeah. So <clears throat> these photos are kind of right ground zero, right, Brian? Yeah. So, so this is Alanthus in ground zero, guys, that has slime flux and bark blowouts on a healthy tree. So they've been feeding on these trees now for seven, five, six years, maybe. Yeah. They're dying. Guess what? They're, they're blowing out. So is this what we can expect in the future? On other species beyond Atlantis, we don't know. Um, but that slime flux is a, is a, is a in the Atlantis, you imagine the stink of Atlantis. When you cut into Atlantis, it has that odor of almost a rancid peanut butter. Take that and distill it down into a high test alcohol. And it, and it is, it's alcohol. And you can smell that tree, you can smell that fl slime flux 40 yards before you get to it on, on a hot day. It wow. reeks. And, uh, you know, you see the explosion that took, care, took place underneath the bark. So. Absolutely. And then just to show you the results of dead spotted lantern fly on the mat with the image at how effective it was. Getting it in in that July time frame will give you a season long control versus the untreated. The, the, these are the things that we want you guys to know that you have an effective product when you go out and it's gonna last for the season. Um, we have a new uh, website, guys, if you wanna join the good, Goodbye Spotted Lanterns Fly with our proven solution that we have data on that you can visit. And then uh, make sure that you're registered as an Arborjet uh, service provider because you can have professionals and for homeowners they can find uh, service providers out there by going to the website. So, um, questions, guys? How often can a grown adult lay a set of eggs? So there's a little bit of confusion with that. Originally, it was reported that a female could lay between one and three clutches per year. Um, based on what we saw last year, we're, we're leaning more towards one. Uh, because it really empties her abdomen out. Last year was a bit of an outlier because of the volume of rain that we had and uh, the development was much slower for the adults. So I'm not going to say that they can't lay multiple if the conditions are right, but I th I'm leaning towards we get one, one mass per year uh, based on what we witnessed last year and we were watching really close last year. Yep. Matt Derrickson is asking, so with the egg masses visible in some areas, would now be the time to do injections on the trees with them present? Uh, my feeling is no, because those nymphs are probably going to leave that tree and it's going to be, uh, you run the risk of not getting the full season of control if you do the injection now. Uh, it's, a, it's a gamble. I, I think an example would be, is uh, like Brian talked about the white pines. You know, yeah. if you if you would go out and inject the white pines, they're not going to be there. They're not going to. They're feed not going to feed on that tree. They're going to walk away. So I, I really think the ideal time is uh, mid June or early July. Any time yeah. in July is when I would be going out to do treatment. Yeah. Okay. Uh, John Jacobs is asking. Um, you know, and I know you mentioned that uh, uh, departments of agriculture, state departments of agriculture, are keeping track, but. You know, our state or federal agencies helping in the eradication effort. Yeah, there's that a lot of money going into the eradication effort. My personal feeling is that because they're only focusing on Atlantis, they're m missing too much of the life cycle. Um, they're killing some with the Atlantis, but as I, I showed in my presentation at, at that high school, that was Department of Agriculture work and you know, 120 meters away from their treated trap trees, we have 93 egg masses in a maple. Um, it's very possible that those adults came in and never fed on that Atlantis. They may have fed somewhere else, moved into the maple, laid their eggs. Um, but the point being is that that maple, where it's located in the middle of a parking lot, it's the only decent sized tree in that area. Um, that, to me, is, is one that's a no-brainer. You're going to treat that tree when you see it on because they're going to have to take a meal to get through that parking lot if they're landing anywhere in that vicinity. So, yes, the answer is 
There are a lot of fantastic people from the Department of Agri Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, the USDA, that are working hard at this. It's right now a philosophical difference um, in, in I'm not agreeing with how they're handling it based on the evidence that we saw and, and produced last year. There are some fantastic people and they put their hearts and souls into this and they are doing just absolute yeoman's work just in the quarantine and figuring out what trucking companies, what train companies, what, what is going on in this region to try and, try and keep this quarantine uh, in place in trying to just identify all the locations. When you start looking at 13 counties in Pennsylvania, square mileage, that is a logistical nightmare. They are doing a fantastic job and they're, they're working hard. I just don't agree with the application methodology and the targeting. Um, and I wanna make that very clear. So yeah, they are working, they're working hard. The problem is this bug is just kicking our butts up, down, left, and right because it is so new and I feel like every day I go out there in the summer I'm learning something new and I'm making a new correlation. It is, it is freaking versatile. It can adapt and it can change to what's in front of it. So, I think one thing too is uh, you know treatment should be from July into September, October. I mean maybe we, till a leaf drop. I, I, I right, mean, you're to, gonna, right to senesce, yeah. to the point where they're not feeding. If you have a tree, we went into October last year, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to depend on the season. But if you treat late into October, um, not late into October, for us it's early October, you can still knock out a fair amount of females before they get a chance to lay Absolutely. eggs. Because they will lay eggs right up to the freeze. In fact, I, I filmed them... Uh, a female last year in a rain at 34 degrees laying eggs. Slowly, very slowly, but she was still cranking them out. She got the development and needed to get those eggs laid. So um, they're working hard. I hope that they come around in time to, to more of what, what we're seeing. And I know you talked a little bit about how, you know, it's an adaptive species. It's, it reproduces very quickly in a lot of ways but some of our viewers are asking it seems like why now all of a sudden you know you get a species here from you know Asia and then you know why did this it seems like it's all of a sudden it's a huge problem at least to some uh, of our viewers I, I think I think it's pretty simple I mean think how much importing we do now I, I mean we used to manufacture a lot of things in the U.S., and now it's all trade, and we're bringing in pallets from China that aren't Sh debarked. Sh shipping containers. Shipping stone. Yeah. I mean, uh, th these things lay eggs. They could have laid on marble, and, and it's sitting in a marble yard, and they hatch out. So uh, I think there's another new invasive up in uh, Maine now, the brown tail moth. You know, so we're getting a new invasive species. I mean, it could be every day that we get something new, and we just don't know about the, it. The, the, other, the other thing is... As, as a global economy, we've become so efficient at moving these shipping containers. They may close the door in Asia, and that, that uh, container is being unoffloaded in seven, 10 days in the United States. And that's not, we've lost that dying period where, where these things would have died naturally along the way as live insects, especially the brown marmorated stink bugs. Um, but it's the, it's the volume and the speed that we're doing this um, open the doors and let it out and and here we are and and when it's an egg like that those eggs can they're, they're durable they can take a lot uh, the number i heard was that approximately seven problematic insects we're bringing into this country a year wow. the problems the ones like this that are, that are a problem so yes it is getting faster and it is it is destroying our natural resources the loss of the ashes um, the, the Dutch elm disease did it a while ago, but it goes all the way back to chestnut blight in, in the early 1900s. Billions of trees killed. Um, we understand these things better and we should know better now, but until there's some kind of outcry, uh, the legislature is not going to require these importers to have the containers checked, inspected, fumigated, whatever it takes. It, it's it's going to be a political issue. Eventually, 
the billions of dollars that we lose and the billions of dollars that we're going to spend to try and and uh, clean up after the fact, we're going to have to get smarter and look at it on the front side and spend a little bit before the container gets opened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A couple viewers, uh, Sean and Mike, were talking about shipping. Uh, considered an acceptable destruction of egg masses? Yes, no? Shipping, there was a study done, um, USDA, I believe, and PDA, um, did it in Penn State Extension, did it in the first year. And what they did was they chipped with a, uh, to, to one by one chips, put them in buckets, and I'm trying to remember, this is going back three years now. They did find that the uh, mechanical chipping did destroy the egg masses. They got no hatch uh, out of the ones that they studied. So yes, it is a, a considered, uh, Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture considers it an effective way to destroy egg masses, but still, I would take, wouldn't take the chance on taking those chips out of a quarantine area, um, but yeah, it is, it is officially considered effective, I believe. Yep. Uh, another viewer was asking, uh, or he was basically commenting, saying, I can see the potential to use 10 categories of my pesticide license. Yeah, and, that, yeah. and that's a problem. Uh, with, with the snake oil sales, we have uh, exterminators spraying the outsides of houses with contact poisons and legally they can and it and it's, can be effective where these things land on houses. Um, the, the, in terms of it, it, is, it is absolutely affecting uh, shipping. Uh, so if you have a trucking yard and there's a potential for eggs to be laid, do you want to spray contact poison on those trucks that may be sitting in the yard so that a female doesn't climb in there and lay eggs? There, there's just, you know, category after category to he use here. Um, but I'm going to go back to saying we can't spray our way out of this. We're going to have to make, uh, you know, smart choices. I, I have seen customers, uh, not my customers so much, they're, they're, they tend to be smarter than this, but homeowners that would never have thought of doing such things before are using kerosene, spraying their trees with kerosene to try and kill these numbers <laughs> because they're trying to save the tree. And the first thing I say is maybe the kerosene's not so good for the tree. Uh, bleach, um, uh, we did have a customer thought she was spraying seven, it turned out it was Roundup. She sprayed her, uh, her red maple pretty well, the whole underside of the, the, the canopy with Roundup. And um, so we're seeing this, we're seeing phenomenal use of insecticide that hasn't happened in our region ever before. Um, but, you know, it's, it's what it is. This, the numbers of this thing and the nuisance factor drives people to make really crazy decisions. A couple of people talking about power washing. Uh, talk a little bit about power washing and then uh, Jim was mentioning that you know he's heard of people putting putting in insurance claims to redo their debts that's a new one to me but it doesn't surprise me uh, yeah. I've, I've seen I've seen Trex decking that you can't get that with a pressure washer you can't get that sooty mold out of the porousness of those boards um, it's it doesn't surprise me um, you, you can't, you shouldn't pressure wash your trees to get rid of the sooty mold. And if you have, you know, nice specimen white birches and it's covered in black, it, it kind of loses the effectiveness um, for, for what it's there as a specimen. I, I wouldn't recommend pressure washing the bark of your trees like that, but um, I've seen it done. <laughs> I've seen the foliage pressure washed to get the sooty mold off too. And people are doing it. Not a good idea. Yeah. Well, and the, uh, the umbrella was a really good example of what it can do sure. to, you know, and, a deck and, or, or a surface. And, Absolutely. And vehicles, if you have a large tree over your driveway, your vehicle will get black if you're not taking it to the car wash at least weekly. So, mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Well, that wraps up this segment of questions. We will take another break and we'll be back with a few more Final viewer questions and a couple of comments from Brian and Trent, so stay tuned. Thanks. Hi, I'm Kale Royer, head party animal at treestuff.com. I'm here to make sure that everyone knows about our Tree Stuff party program. Each month, volunteer arborists from different regions host free recreational climbing events powered by treestuff.com. 
giving local arborists a chance to meet, hang out, climb, and try out some cool new gear in the trees. Every Tree Stuff party is 100% free, so there's no reason to not bring your family, friends, coworkers, and acquaintances. Check our Facebook events page to learn about upcoming Tree Stuff parties, and sign up to be notified when there's a new Tree Stuff party in your neck of the woods at treestuff.com parties. It's all about seeing friends, making new friends, and having fun in the trees. I hope you can make it to a party soon. I love everything about it. I mean, from the guys I work with to like everything I'm learning. The arborist community is second to none worldwide. Anyone that works in other industries and tries and sees what the arborist community is about always flocks to the arborist community. If I meet somebody and they say they climb trees, I'm like, hey, you're my you're my people. It makes social settings very comfortable because we all share the same thing in that our successes and our failures those are all something that we a lot of us in some ways share similar experiences. They also realize how much it takes to be an arborist and so for the most part are very supportive of other people doing it and are down to help and share and there's a real I mean people really care about each other. Just helping everybody come about in their career and life. Hey, Tree Stuff customers, we've got a great deal for you. You can get these free, free, free. You know, spring is here and the tree care industry and tree care professionals are getting ready to ramp up for the tree season. And you know, if you're gonna buy some gear, hey, you could get these free. Let me tell you a little bit about them. This Notch Pro Bag, an $80 value. Here's what you can do to get it free. Build a cart on treestuff.com for $450 or more, and you get this. Need more room in your bag for all your stuff? Well, hey, if you want the Notch Pro Deluxe bag, this is $160. Uh, 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 it's a, a value of $160. Build a cart of $700 or more, and you get this. But say, hey, you got a lot of gear? Take both of these, build a cart of $1,000 or more, and you get both of these, a 200, almost $240 value. You can get anything and everything in this bag. Look at that, we got a saddle in here. We got a, look at that, a saw. Hey, I need a hand, right? We even got 150 feet of rope in here. These things are durable, they're tough, I use them myself, and I can't say enough good things about them. So hey, go to our Facebook page, as if you're not already on it, right? Go to that Facebook page, look for the ad, you'll see it there, or go to treestuff.com, right up there on the top, you'll find more information on how you can get these bags for free, treestuff.com. Any more questions we got? Basically, uh, at, at this point, uh, how about some final thoughts? Just, uh, you know, what, what is this year going to look like? What is this shaping up to be? I know there's a lot. I know you don't have a crystal ball, Trent and Brian, but what does it look like um, for I, I this want, season? I, I, I want arborists to be proactive and, and homeowners, homeowners to be looking for this pest and, and making the state agencies aware um, so, so we can be proactive and stop the spread. Uh, my fear is, is you know, it's in these um, five states now. How many more states can it go? Will it get into Ohio, the Midwest? Will it get down into the Carolinas? You know, th the warmer climate scare me because I don't know what the reproduction capabilities of this pest can be. Uh, I know if you go to China and Korea and you come over here, we match up perfectly other than when you get into Canada and the colder temperatures. So my fear is the southern states and how fast it expands because it, it's moving. It's, it's moving. moving fast. Yep. So um, be proactive, uh, make good choices about uh, IPM with this, and, and let, let's try to stop the spread of this pest. That, that's what I want out of this. Yep. Okay. Um, another question is, is uh, when, when giving a silver maple its first round uh, subordination prune, when the brush fell, Spotted lanternfly came right back to ascend the trunk. When smacking them off the trunk, they came right back to ascend. Why not fly away? 
Well, first question I would ask is what time of year was it? Um, if it, you're asking why it didn't fly, I'm assuming it's an adult. Uh, early adult, they tend not to fly so much. And these guys are kind of funny flyers. They, they, will, they will climb to the top of that telephone pole to get a little bit of lift on the wind and, and launch out. They're not the strongest flyers, which was mistaken early on as can't fly. When the conditions are right, they're good flyers, but they generally tend to lift off where they have a little bit of elevation. If they can walk, they're going to walk. And it may just be that they really like that tree. Mm -hmm. It may be that they were tired. If they came in on, on a dispersal flight, it seems like they have a period of time where they have to refuel for a while before they can, they can gear up to flying again. Uh, we saw that last year in, in the dispersals. There was good weather after a big movement, but they needed an extra 24, 48 hours to refuel and, uh, and launch again. So, yeah, good, good, good question. I don't have a great answer for you. Okay. Sean Smith uh, says he works transmission row or ROW. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure what that is, so forgive me, Sean. What would be the best sites to check for this pest as I cannot check all the possible trees and have any production potential? First thing you're going to do, look for, look for sooty mold. Look for your usual suspect trees uh, that we've been mentioning. Look for sooty mold. Uh, look for bees and yellow jackets. That's a good indication there's honeydew. You start to see something amiss, um, you know, check it out. You can't check them all. You can scan while you're walking. You can you stop by, look up as the thunder crashes, and uh, <laughs> the uh, you know look to the undersides of limbs. If you see that splotch of, of white or miscolored, um, take a, take a closer look at it. You're right. You can't check everything and uh, and be productive. If you're at someone, uh, if you're at a job, take a walk and look at you know, the usual suspect trees in the area while you're there to do something else. Take five minutes and look. Um, certainly, you can waste some time on this bug, as I, as I have proven over and over well, again. And I think, too, the instars, you know, the red instars would jump out at you. Yeah. The black, I, I would not First, First say. through third, they're, they're tough they're to see. They're tough to see, but the, the fourth instar, when it's that bright red, that may be something to look for, which could be, depending on the degree days and the way the hatch is, yep. you know, in a couple months. Yeah, generally, you know, you're going to see that, that fourth instar before adult, generally uh, beginning of July. You're going to start mm -hmm. seeing that bright red added to the color. So. Daniel says that he's witnessed them attacking um, a crimson maple during removal. During removal? During removal is what he said. Interesting. Yeah, doesn't surprise me. Uh, Crimson King, uh, Norway family, not usually the preferred, but I've certainly seen it. Uh, given the preference for something else in the area, uh, given the choice of something else in the area, it generally the Norways aren't the first choice. Not to say that I haven't seen a good number of them under attack. So, yeah, not surprising. As far as going back under, you know, they, they are drawn to that vertical tree shape, and uh, they're drawn to a meal. If they were getting good flow in there, they're going to go back to it. Yeah, and Sean just uh, chimed in again. He said he's got 600 miles of line to check for the uh, transmission right-of-ways, and now he's going to be doubly busy. Wow. <laughs> well, do your best, and, and while you're out there, take a look. You know, if you see it, then, then it's time to look, time to look further in the area. Uh, you find one, there's a good chance there's more, but don't make yourself crazy trying to do just that, you know. Yeah. yeah. How can people get a hold of you, Trent? Uh, email. Uh, you can go to the website, uh, arborjet.com, and look up the, me, or tdix at arborjet.com, or text me, call me on my cell phone, which is listed, guys. I'm happy to help. And he'll be back here in like a month. I will. So, I will. so if you could wait that long, you, you can ask him again. Absolutely. Hey guys, thank you so much for yep. joining us. Thank we you. really appreciate it. Having us. Lots of information yep. Yep. And, and best of luck to everyone out there in the field who's, yep. you know, you guys who are on the front line, the ladies who are on the front line witnessing all this. If you see something, say something, say right? Something. Yep. Spottedlanderfly.com, get in touch with Trent. Uh, we'll, we'll get you in touch with the right people wherever you are. Um, don't assume that your local agency has any clues to what you'll be talking about. Um, but 
get yourself educated, get your customers educated, and don't make the problem worse with uh, going off label and doing crazy applications. Yeah. All right, yeah. Hey, and we want to remind our viewers that there is a quiz where you can earn ISA CEUs right after this webinar. We're going to post the link in just a little bit, but we also want to remind you that the ISA says it's going to take about four to eight weeks for these CEUs to be reflected onto your uh, account and, of course, processed. So give it a little bit of time. Again, four to eight weeks because we got to keep it open for like a week, week and a half, so everybody can take the test, you know, after this, you know, not everybody takes a test on the day of the webinar, so we like to give everybody an opportunity to do that, and then of course we have to send that to ISA for them to process, so bear with us, they will get those CEUs to you as soon as they can. Uh, we also want you to join us here Thursday, May 23rd at six o'clock, right here on our Facebook page. We have another amazing webinar here with Trent Dix and Joe Aiken, both from ArborJet. We're going to be talking about spring planting and, of course, spring injections as well, right, Trent? Absolutely, absolutely. We're actually going to do a demonstration and uh, show off our new uh, triage product, R10. So it should, it should be, be exciting, exciting, guys. Lots, Lots of fun. fun. And that's, uh, again, about a month away. So make sure you, uh, it's appointment television, I believe, or appointment Facebook webinar watching guys so uh, make sure you join us for uh, that webinar series and plenty more we're also going to have CEUs available for that webinar as well so thanks everybody for joining us we really appreciate it it's raining like cats and dogs out there so it's kind of hard for us to hear but uh, we appreciate you bearing with us and we hope we gave you some information tonight and make sure that you uh, tune into some of our other webinar series we have them on Facebook and of course they're going to be on our YouTube page as well for Jake Miller and the rest of the crew here at Tree Stuff, Kale, who's directing, and of course, Carson and Nick, everybody contributed to this webinar. Thank you so much for making it great, and thanks to you. Good night, everybody. Good night.